All right. Oh, cool. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. <laughs> I'm MC Owens. Uh, it's great to see all of your little faces. Um, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, it's, um, uh, what can I say? What can I say? This is a little strange, of course, being in a little room without all of you. Um, but since it looks like we're all here that are coming, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what's going on. I think we all would probably just like to dig into some Dharma and um, just have a, a good hour and a half. Yeah. So, um, and I don't know how, I don't know how this works with uh, questions and stuff. So hopefully nobody has any, right? Um, we'll, we'll see. Um, but I'm going to go ahead I'm going to go ahead and get started like I normally do. And I'm going to introduce the sutra tonight, uh, talk about of it and what we're doing, uh, and then dive into it. So again, I hope everybody can hear me okay and see me okay and all of that. Um, cool. Hi, Noe. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so um, the sutra we're doing tonight is called the Bahu Vadaniya Sutta, uh, translated as all feelings or all the sensations, all the possible feelings or sensations. And <clears throat> what we're dealing with tonight is these uh, Vedana the uh, sensations, right? If you had been coming to the center and came to either the four foundations of mindfulness uh, two Sundays ago, or if you came last week to the class on the body, uh, what we've been working on is looking at the foundations of mindfulness, uh, the foundations of sati, this practice of focused awareness, and the basic idea is that within Buddhism, there are these four foundations of mindfulness, some bedrock base things to place one's mind on or mindfulness on, the body, sensations, the mind, and dharma or dharmas, plural. And of course, I did the first Two weeks ago, I did a class where we talked about all four. Last week, we just talked about the body, and we just talked about the body in terms of breath. So there are actually multiple aspects of the body one can meditate on or be mindful of. Uh, the, the breath, posture, internal body organs, the working of the body organs, the decomposition of the body. It went on and on. But so there are a variety of different aspects to the body and meditating or being mindful of the body. So tonight we're going to do a sutra that just looks at, not just looks at this idea of sensations. And as the title, the Bahu Vedaniya Sutra, as the title means, it's all the sensations, all the possible. Uh, feelings. Feelings is the way this word vidana is usually translated. You might see it as feelings. Feelings is a little misleading though perhaps because what we're talking about is not emotional feelings. Uh, what we're actually talking about is sensory stimulation from the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and even the brain. But the reason why feeling is a little weird is because we tend not to think of ourselves as feeling with the eyes when we're looking at something. Whereas we do tend to think of it as sensing, sensing with the eyes. And so sensations are actually what we're, is kind of a, a better translation, at least for tonight, of this vidana, um, looking at all this possible sensory sensations. This sutra is fun, though, because you get a whole world of sensations. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from it. This is, again, from the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, and this is number 59. 
there you go, Noe. So, um, you want to read the first part of the sutra to get us up to speed where we're at, what we're talking about. Uh, and then we're going to jump on the whiteboard. So, uh, and also like if you don't, if you don't have a copy of this, a uh, fortunate aspect of being at home is we're online. And so the, this sutta is very easy to find access to insight. Uh, there's a number of versions online if you don't have one. Or you can just kick back, relax, and listen to this uh, Bahu Vedaniya Sutta. Thus have I heard on one occasion, Blessed One, the Buddha. Hmm? Uh oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Everybody okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I'll, I'll ignore those little uh, messages for now. So, thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One, the Buddha, was living in Shavast, in Jeddah's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. Then the carpenter, uh, uh, Pansakanga, went to Venerable Udayin, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and asked him, Venerable sir, how many kinds of sensations, how many kinds of feeling have stated by the Blessed One, by the Buddha? Three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One householder, carpenter, pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither pleasant nor painful feelings. These three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Not three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One, Venerable Udayin, said the carpenter. Two kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Oh, pleasant feelings, painful feelings. This neither painful nor pleasant feeling has been stated by the Blessed One as a peaceful and sublime kind of pleasure. Hmm. A second time and a third time, the Venerable Udayin stated his position, and a second time and a third time, the carpenter Pansakanga stated his. But the Venerable Udayin could not convince the carpenter Pansakanga, nor could the carpenter Pansakanga convince the Venerable Udayin. The Venerable Ananda, the Buddha's young cousin, he heard their conversation. Then he went to the Blessed One, to the Buddha, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and reported to the Blessed One the entire conversation between the Venerable Udayin and the carpenter Pansakanga. When he had finished, the Blessed One told the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, it was actually a true presentation that the carpenter Pansakanga would not accept Ayin. And it was actually a true presentation that Udayin would not accept from the carpenter Pansakanga. I have stated two kinds of feelings in one presentation. I've stated three kinds of feeling in another presentation. I've stated five kinds of feeling in another presentation. I've stated six kinds of feelings in another presentation. I've stated 18 kinds of feeling in another presentation. I've stated 36 kinds of feeling in another presentation. I've stated 108 kinds of feeling in another presentation. That is how the Dharma has been shown to me in different presentations. When the Dharma has thus been shown by me, it may be expected of those who will not concede, allow, and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others, that they will take to quarreling, brawling, and disputing, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. But it may be expected of those who concede, allow, and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others, 
that they will live in concord with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. So let's pause there because the, the text, the sutra, doesn't actually go into the two, three, five, six, eighteen, thirty-six, and hundred and eight kinds of feelings or kinds of sensation. So I thought it was fun to go through those because like many sutras, this sutra sort of presumes that you read all those other sutras in which the Buddha talks about all these different kinds of feelings. And since we're spending the month focusing on the four foundations and kind of spending a week on each of the foundations, I thought this would be a great sutra to go through all these different ways of thinking about feeling or again, sensation. All right. So I'm going to proceed. Again, this is a little tricky as far as questions. I don't even know how that would work, but I hope everybody's having a good so, as the Buddha said, and, and of course, what I love about this sutra is this idea that Udayin, the monk, thinks he's right. And Panzakanga, the carpenter, he thinks he's right. <laughs> They're going to convince each other, no, no, that's not what the Buddha said. No, no, that's what the Buddha said. When it turns out, the Buddha said it all. And so it's kind of interesting that they were both uh, a little trapped by their understanding of the Dharma and unwilling to hear what the other person was saying, right? So that's an interesting point there. Let's go through these, what the Buddha said about these sensations. So again, the, the sutra doesn't go into this. And so um, I'm drawing from some footnotes. I'm drawing from other sutras. And so I just, like usual, I'm going to try to give you a broad picture of all of this. Uh, we're going to start with the two kinds of feelings, that there are just two. All right. And there are actually, yeah, you guessed it, two different ways about this. The easiest way, actually, just to think, uh, and this was a uh, uh, I believe Pantakanga position. Yeah, Pantakanga said, no, no, there's just two kinds. Two kinds. Good and bad. Positive, negative. What the text translates as pleasant and painful. But I want you to keep in mind that these words pleasant and painful mm, closer to like Negative and positive because pain pain has patient to it and we're going to talk about ways uh pain you know is maybe particular to the so pleasant painful negative positive just fit in that kind of negative positive realm and don't dig too deep into the pleasant and painful right very quick, I want to introduce, there's a, um, um, a spectrum of experience, a spectrum of sensation that's going to be talked about through Sutra, and this is as good a point as any to explain that. In terms of this positive, like pleasant sensations, and as far as these painful or negative sensations, there's sort of a spectrum of experience within them that the greatest, highest state of pleasure is a state called sukha, joy, bliss, sukha, bliss. And in terms of the painful side, the negative side of things, the absolute bong of negative sensations is dukkha. And so in you dukkha, dukkha is this idea of suffering, the, the displeasurable in Buddhism. And so there's this word in, in spirit that's actually sukha dukkha. Sukha dukkha is the entire range of possible human experience from absolute joy to utter, utter grief, pain, despair, displeasure, you name it. 
So sukha dukkha. I want you to keep those, the idea of joy or bliss and the idea of suffering or dukkha. Keep that in mind too. That again is the simple way of explaining sensations. They're either negative or positive. Now, in an other presentation, right, using the language of the discourse here, in an other presentation, the Buddha explains the two kinds of feelings as being feelings of the body and feelings of the mind. The body in this case is, is not necessarily uh, kaya. You might have been aware of the word kaya is the body, the foundation of mindfulness. But in here we're talking about rupa, matter, versus nama or mind. And in Buddhism, there is the idea of nama rupa. Nama rupa is mind body. And so the idea is, is that the Buddha in one presentation said that there are two kinds of sensations, sensations that come to us from the body and sensations that come to us from the mind. So that's one way of distinguishing it, or there's this pleasant painful. And that's just within the realm of two, of just splitting sensations into two different types. Now we're going to take up uh, the monk in the, in the sutra, the monk. We're going to take up Udayin's position, which is no, 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 no. The Buddha said there's three kinds of sensations. Three kinds of uh, pleasant, sukha, painful, dukkha, and neither pleasant nor painful. Hey, neither Michael. nor. Yeah, hey. Hey, if I make a question before you continue with the text. Love it. Uh, you were just talking about how, especially in this uh, Theravada Sutra, the uh, Pali Canon, uh, what's stressed there is this relationship between Nama and Rupa. Like, but Rupa, as you were all, almost calling it, like the material stuff that is out there, and it's like something out there. And even to the point where it's told, and I think you have even explained to us in that way where uh, individual parts of my body, like if somebody will rip off my arm, my separated arm will still have uh, this vedana, right? Sensations. There's like this idea that even like, yeah, we are not like the whole body, but we are like multiple, uh, fathomless everything in that sense but it's more but what i want to ask that maybe is is it is this view correct in the sense that it seems for me that in the mahayana approach in the sanskrit sources the mahayana sutras the v, the view of the mind is one that it actually leaves the material body so there's a court and you can uh, read about Nagarjuna talking about how essentially a corpse is just a corpse, like there's no mind there. And I think that, uh, like many schools like Yogacara and Chitamatra, elaborate on the sense that there is something transcendent to the rupa that so, and that consciousness is not in the rupa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, this, your question raises a big issue, which is that we are dealing with a very early Buddhist text, what could be called a Theravada uh, or, you know, a Pali Sutta. And I don't want to get too into it, but the early schools of Buddhism have, I don't want to call it a problem, but in the West, we call it the mind body problem. And it's, it's, it's a classic philosophical problem, which is what is the relationship between the physical body and the mind? It's called the mind-body problem. Early Buddhism has the problem. It eventually gets resolved in the mind-only school where, where they realize, oh yeah, thinking of something as form, thinking of something as a material form is a, a way of thinking. Like it is a lakshana, it's a mind, mind thing. But we're not there yet, meaning this text is not at Mali yet. 
And I would refer to, if you want to kind of uh, have an idea of what is really being talked about in this mind-body split here, I would refer uh, many sutras, many, many sutras, but I would refer you to the Nakula Pita, the little Nakula Pita Sutta that we did where there was an old man whose body hurt and he went to the Buddha and he said, hey, I'm old and my body aches, this sucks. And the Buddha says, yeah, yeah, you are old and I bet it does ache, but it doesn't mean that your mind needs to ache. It means you don't need to be afflicted in mind. And that d division, which is an early division in Buddhism, which is this idea that you could be experiencing so-called pain in the body, but one does not need to be grieving and painful in mind. That's the best, like for tonight, that's a good distinction to make that I think will help, especially when we get to number five. So yeah, Eric? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so of course, what I find interesting in this uh, little sutra is that uh, our carpenter, our layperson, uh, Pansakanga, I thought it was interesting that he, and the Buddha backs him up on this, right? The Buddha says, no, I, I, he was right. I said that. And it's interesting that he says, oh, no, there's two kinds of sensations, uh, pleasant and painful. And this neither nor, right? He says, this neither painful nor pleasant feeling has been stated by the Buddha as a peaceful and sublime kind of pleasure. So that's interesting. And, I, and I've often said that that space of, of neutral sensations, that space of, of neither having a bad reaction to something or a positive reaction, but just that neutral space, it's a very special place to to be mindful of i think we are often mindful of when things suck and and they're not pleasant and yeah we are often mindful of when things are pleasurable but that interesting space of neither pleasurable nor painful is a space where sort of the dharma practitioner places their attention in this in this uh, category of three sensations now we're gonna move on to the five sensations. And these are going to be bodily pleasure, mental pl uh, pleasure, bodily pain, mental pain, and the fifth as equanimity, upeksha, if you're familiar with your geonic states. And the idea here is, is that we kind of have a combination of the body mind and then the pleasant pain called neutral this is where the buddha is making a distinction between like he did in the nakula pita sutta of having affliction in the body like bodily pain but not affliction in the mind that the two could be operating distinctly in that way and so I would also um, want to draw your attention to it's usually bodily pleasure, mental sukha, mental joy or bliss. And there's sort of a tacit assumption in Buddhism that one doesn't achieve joy and bliss through the body, but actually through the mind. And it's just a distinction in the way pleasure and pain versus joy and grief work. Because if we do bodily pleasure, but mental sukha, mental joy, it's going to be bodily pain, bodily suffering, and mental dukkha, grief. That's the idea is that this sort of, it's why I wanted to introduce you to that the the full spectrum of sukha dukkha right and this idea of achieves uh blissful states of meditation in the mind to transcend grief stricken states of mind if that makes sense 
And then, of course, the fifth of these is upeksha, equanimity. It's akin to neither perception or neither pleasurable nor painful, but equanimity or upeksha is a is a little different than neither nor, because upeksha is, is this very equanimous uh, place of being, right? That is neither joy nor grie grieving, grief griefful, something like that. All right. Um, any questions? Can I ask a question? Yeah, hey, Nam. Hey, Michael. I, you keep answering my questions before I can ask them, but it's oh, good. moving on to something a little different now, so I will. I just, I'm actually asking for verification that I'm understanding correctly that in regards to the body, you would, you are using the words pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant or painful, but in regards to the mind, you're using sukha dukkha and equanimity is that yes right or am I, yeah okay yeah so you, and 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 i'm kind of drawing on on some notes that are kind of modern in that way but hey it's a theravadan text um do want to again it's a mind body problem but they distinction between the mind and the body and the mind is what experiences sort of the joy or the grief in that way thank you yeah and that, that'll actually play into where the text goes um, as far as that we're heading to geonic states. So, uh, but really quickly, just to keep us moving along, I'm gonna go to the six. So then in a whole other sutra, in a whole other presentation, the Buddha said there's six kinds of vedana, six kinds of sensations, sensations that come to us from the eye, or eyes, ears, from the nose, from the tongue, from the body, and then from the brain. Now, I'd like to point out that for all intents and purposes, these six sense bases, as they're called, the six sense ayatana, in, the, in these, the sixth, the mind, is the brain. And the reason why I want to point that out is because, you know, in English, it, we, we lack a few words in English. And so we have this word mind, which if you remember is the third foundation of mindfulness, but those are mind states uh, called citta, C-I-T-T-A, citta. That mind states and that type of mind, which is a, in, in a, um, an agglomeration of the body, the sense organs, the brain, all of that. There's this mental state that arises from all of that. Chitta, chitta is like a, a mental state. It's like, it's the whole kit and caboodle. The mind down here, this is just the brain. And what is very clear about it, you can have sensations that come to you by the eyeball. And it's like, ah, oh, like a light right here. Ooh. Right? So that's a sensation from the eye. That's how I'm getting it. If you're hearing me, that's through the ear. But when the mind is thinking about something or imagining a sense impression, like imagining a sunset, like just imagine a sunset for a minute, like the sun right on the horizon there, like really orange, like that's all your brain sensing things. Her eyes right now didn't see the sunset. It was your mind that sort of sensed the sunset. And so that's a sensation of the mind. And then, of course, body is anything from uh, physical pleasure, physical pain, an orgasm, you name it. That's all in the body. Eating something, pleasurable, what have you. Those are the six ways of sensing through the six sense organs kind of makes total sense and so it shouldn't come as a big surprise that in order to become to 18 that in another sutra in another presentation the buddha said there's 18 kinds of senses and what those teen are and uh, just to remind everybody i'm sure you all 
remember, I'll know this. But of course, Buddhism, the kind of Buddhist teachings that, that there are these six sense organs, said eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and brain. And then those six sense organs all correspond to six sense stimuli, light, sound, sense, tactility, and again, ideas. Well, what Buddhism talks about is when an eyeball comes into contact with light, there emerges a, they call it a consciousness, a vijnana, but it's actual eye consciousness. And eye consciousness emerges when the eyeball hits the light. Oh, there emerges a, a, a kind of seeing, but it's not seeing like with the brain and the mind and all that just yet. It's actually in the eyeball that a consciousness arises, a little consciousness in the ear. In, in English, we would just call this hearing, but in Buddhism, they actually think of it as a form of discrimination, a form of consciousness. And so each of six kinds of consciousness could be joy, full of grief, equanimous. And those are your 18 sensations. Uh, a joyful or pleasant bodily sensation a bad nose sensation, a bad smell, smelling something bad. That is the nose having a bad or unpleasant sensation. Well, of course, what one could have though is also a bodily sensation of equanimity. You could have an eye sensation of equanimity. You could be having a no sensation of equanimity with a mind. You see where this is going. Like you could have variations of that depending on your mental state. But that would constitute 18 distinct sensations, if that makes sense. Yeah? Everybody good? Cool. 36. So the 36 sensations are, are 18 sensations as experienced by a householder, like, like our carpenter, or by a renunciant, like our monk, right? So you have all of these, but I guess the bodily equanimity of a householder is a little different than the bodily equanimity of a renunciant. That's what we're to understand with distinction, casting it into 36, right? And of course, I just point out the allegorical nature of the sutra, where we have a lay person and a monk having these kind of discussions. So that's sort of represented here. We're having different sensations. And finally, the magic number. Magic number 108. Where does magic number 108 come from? Right? Well, what you have is, is you have the 36 kinds of sensations, which are the 18 kinds of sensations experienced by a household or a renunciate. And then you have those 36 experienced in the past, in the present, or the future. So you could have a monk who had a joyful bodily experience, <laughs> if you see what I'm saying. So you have 108 now possibilities of sensory experience. Any questions about all the feelings? <laughs> you good on all the feelings? Hey, Michael, I had a question. Oh, hi. Um, I was wondering, because <clears throat> if these are the four foundations of mindfulness or like back in the four foundations of mindfulness context like how do we have sensations of the body without going through vedana like is there a way to experience the body directly or is it just all sort of coming up through sensations oh uh, yeah so it's this is why it's helped to you know um to think about or if for last week i'll i'll say again 
you know, the first foundation of mindfulness, that being the body, you know, that's about being aware of being an embodied being, being aware of having a body. And one of the primary actions of that body is respiration, breathing. And so that first foundation of mindfulness, which is focused on placing one's mindfulness on the body, there's, there's no sensations in that. It's not about sensations yet. It's just about awareness of the body. Like, uh, like the sutra says, uh, am I breathing long? Am I breathing short? Um, it's not about the sensations of the body yet. That's where we are tonight. But in that first foundation, one is just being aware of the body, trying to bring one's, you know, attention. Uh, if we take the first step of the body, which is the breath, one's just trying to bring one's attention entirely on the breath, right? So that you're not thinking about anything else. Nothing's popping into your mind. No other thoughts just awareness of the inspiration expiration just awareness of the breathing so the whole first foundation is about establishing that mindfulness using the body to and then the second step of that is then to bring one's awareness to sensations and if you read the satipatthana sutta the the four foundations of mind in that sutra in that presentation the Buddha lists the three. There are the three uh, feelings. Pleasurable or pleasant, painful, and neutral. And so when one has established one's mindfulness of the body, breath, then posture, bodily organs, all the way through to the decomposition of the body, then one brings one's attention or awareness to the sensations of the body pleasant, painful, or neutral. Then when that's firmly established, one then moves on to the mind states and then on to dharmas. What tonight's class is about is like, okay, Buddha, if I'm going to establish my mindfulness on sensations, um, well, it's actually a matter of these are all of the possible ways of establishing one's mindfulness on sensations, because these are all of them, all 108 <laughs> possible sensations a human being can have. And so then the practice would be having done the bodily mindfulness, moving into an awareness of the sensations using any one of these uh, breakdowns, just being aware of like, oh, that was a sensation of my mind. Oh, that was a sensation of my body. Or, oh, that was a pleasant sensation. That was a painful sensation. Pleasant, painful. Or you then bring me up to the level three, where you're then introducing, oh, and that was a new sensation. Huh. <laughs> Five, six, 18, 36, 108. That makes sense? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Uh, anything else? I, I do have a question, sorry. Yeah, no. I actually have a follow-up to that question. Yeah. So, if I'm doing Satipatthana practice and I'm doing body, body awareness, I am, to understand from what you said, that there is, I am, if I am aware of the breath and I find myself being aware that the breath sensation is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. I have, I have to be, I'm, you know, pretend, whatever, when I'm actually meditating, I do whatever I want, but I'm to put that off, like that is not what being aware of the breath means. It's not having any awareness of the sensation of it, of the, of the, the feeling of it. It's just its existence, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, and and I would like to um, uh, just quickly remind everybody that the what the what the the big practice sati 
mindfulness. What the big practice of sati or mindfulness is all about, the way I teach it, is having many, many, many things on one's mind and trying to bring those down to just a, a few things and practices and techniques that bring awareness down to as few things as possible. S simplicity, singularity type of a thing. So the idea is that to be aware of the breath and to be aware of the positive or negative and the breath, those are two different things. My, my mind's now divided. It's a very subtle practice, this practice of mindfulness, because it's actually about trying to, you know, again, bring the uh, amount of stimulation to uh, sing, basically singularity so that when one is then aware of, mindfully aware of a positive sensation, that's, that positive sensation is all one is aware of exclusively that's it or one is attempting to use that singular pleasurable experience in that moment realizing like oh wow my body feels really nice now great focus on that feeling pleasurable feeling of the body great focus on it dive deep into that use that pleasant feeling of the body as an anchor for your mindfulness so that's again yeah they're like what's the difference between being aware of my breath and being aware that i like my breath in buddhism it's huge <laughs> and that, and and just just to answer your question again Noam, that the first part of the body is yes it's just like bearing witness just observing the breath thank you All right, now that we know about all 108 kinds of feelings, um, the Buddha continues. Ananda, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye, that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. There are sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. There are odors cognizable by the nose, that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. There are flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five chords of sensual desire. The, oh, sorry, these are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure, those are called sensual pleasure. Should anyone say, that is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience? I would not concede that. Why is that? Because there is another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. Right. So if anybody comes to you with some a worldly, oh my God, you gotta try this. Oh my God, you gotta go here. Oh my God. Da, da, da. That's right. Does anyone say that is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings can experience? Buddha, I would concede to that to him. Why? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, quiet, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A bhikkhu, a monk, a renunciate, 
enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born, born of seclusion. This is that other kind of pleasure, loft and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Right? So again, this is where we are continuing this kind of division, uh, kind of a, a mind-body division, where we're kind of doing pleasures of this world, sensual pleasures that arrived. Um, if we're going to refer back to the paragraph before that, uh, pleasures that arrive five chords, right? These chords or binding bindings right which are things seen by the eye that we delight in things we hear smell taste things we touch yeah so if anybody should say that they got some pleasure joy utmost joy utmost pleasure from the five sense organs eyes ears nose tongue and body then the buddha would say that there is a a pleasure more loftier than that and that is this first jhana or dhyana if we're going to do the sanskrit this is that first uh meditative state brought about by sati brought about by mindfulness the idea being if one can concentrate that awareness and get it down to very few things so that the mind's not disturbed by this and that and uh, eye, stuff coming to the eye, stuff coming into the ears. If through meditation one can be focused just on one of the four foundations of mindfulness, that mindfulness can bring about a jhana, a meditative absorption, right? And accompanied by applied and sustained thought. So that is the mindfulness part. With rapture, pity, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. All right. That is that other, this is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more slime than the previous pleasure. Should anyone say, that, 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 that is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings can experience. The first jhana, it doesn't get any better than the first jhana. The Buddha says, I would not concede that to him. Oh, why is that? Because there is another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the stilling of a wide and sustained thought, a bhikkhu, a renunciant, enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. And so, if you notice, second jhana, we're, we're moving even more into stillness, right? That was part of that. Here, Ananda, we're stilling of applied and sustained thought, which was an aspect of the first. Now that's still, and that's the second jhana or an aspect of the second jhana. And should anyone say, that, that second jhana, it doesn't get any better than the second jhana, I wouldn't say that, the Buddha says. And what is this other kind of pleasure? Ananda, with the fading away as well of rapture, a bhikkhu, a renunciant, abides in equanimity mindful and fully aware and still feeling pleasure with the body he enters upon and abides in the third jhana 
on which noble ones announce. He has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So, of course, this, this third state getting very close to total stillness, right? He abides in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, but still feeling pleasure in the body, right? That's that third jhana. And should anyone say it doesn't get any better than the third jhana, that's it. The Buddha would not. Because what is uh, loftier than that? What is that other pleasure, Ananda? Well, here, Ananda, with the abandoning, total abandoning of pleasure and pain, and the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu, a renunciant, enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and mindfulness due to equanimity. That other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So, of course, this fourth jhana, equin, total equanimity, complete equanimity. The main character, of course, of this fourth jhana is where trans ideas of pleasure and pain. Because the whole idea is that the previous three were, they're great. They're totally great. They just keep getting more and more pleasurable, actually, until we reach this fourth jhana beyond all, possibly all dualisms. Questions on the four jhanas? Yes. Yeah. So they're almost always described in this sequence of four states. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, and other things I've read about them also describe it that way. Like you um, hit access concentration and then you go up one, two, three, four, or sometimes you'll go like one, two, back to one to make sure that you can do it. But is there anywhere that describes kind of teleporting to a jhana? Like, can you, can you sort of from access concentration go right into the third one? <laughs> can we just go straight to four and skip all the uh, preliminaries? I'm just wondering if there's, do you always have to do them in sequence? And is there something about the mind that does it that way for a reason? Or is there anywhere in the sutras that talks about doing them out of order? It's an interesting question. Uh, last year, towards the end of last year, I did this series on the formless uh, jhanas, uh, infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. Mm -hmm. And I was curious regarding those, if there was ever sutras that talked about just jumping right into infinite consciousness and avoiding the whole infinite space, I couldn't find a place where that happened. And while I was doing that same research, I also didn't come up anywhere in the old stuff, in the suttas, in the Pali stuff, where it's not one, two, three, four. It's always one, two, three, and four. It's a little bit of sense um, as far as if you think of it as a, can I say, like a, a divestment project of like divesting oneself of uh, various sim stimuli. Um, if you think of the past, present, and future even, and so getting rid of past thinking, future thinking, all of this is a process that is it to less and less and less and less, and then even neither nor. And so I think that's the program if that makes sense. Now, I did want to mention, though, that I have often said about this word, uh, dhyana in the sutta, in the suttas, which is dhyana in the Sanskrit tradition, and that idea of dhyana 
you know, goes to China and Japan and becomes the, the word dhyana becomes uh, Zen. The word Zen is dhyana, chana in Chinese, and then the, the uh, Japanese change it to, to Zen. But the idea of Zen, Zen Buddhism, is that's dhyana. But in the Zen tradition, they don't do a lot of talking about first, second, third, and fourth jhana. They do, they do, they do. But in general, they just talk about Zen, <laughs> like just get, getting into dhyana uh, by, you know, uh, Zen in the art of archery or what have you. And of course, Zen little famous for this sudden or instant enlightenment idea. I would suggest that some of that sudden instant enlightenment stuff is jumping right to the fourth jhana, or you could think of it that way. That's cool. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So now once we're in the fourth jhana and we think, should anyone say, that's it. That's the utmost pleasure that beings can experience, the fourth jhana. That's it. The Buddha would not say that. And what is the other kind of pleasure, more loftier and sublime than even the fourth jhana? Well, here, Ananda, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, a bhikkhu, a renunciant, enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. Other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So I already moments ago, and the formless jhanas, which of course are, as the Buddha says, even more sublime and loftier than the, the jhanas of form, which are the four jhanas you just went through. And this first form jhana is this realm of infinite space. Uh, I've done multiple Dharma talks on akasha or space, akasha, because akasha is kind of a idea, even in space, uh, they translate it as infinite space. And I think just to not get too trapped in a long conversation about space, the key to it for tonight is this one of with non-attention to perceptions of diversity. And what's being referred to there is by diversity is the very idea of distinguishing this from that, here, from there, uh, anything, any, any, distinguishing anything from anything else, i.e. to create space between things so that, that that can be that and this can be that. Space is what makes this from that. But if you were to have non-attention to positions of diversity, not only would there be non-diverse, but there would be, it would all start to collapse very, very quickly on itself if you had no attention to perceptions of diversity. Doing that exercise, which is not easy and kind of along the lines of Katie's question, you kind of can't just jump to it, you usually do the four jhanas until you eventually can let go of even distinguishing this from that, and you slip into this state of state, I don't know, but an awareness of a mindful, mindful, infinite space. And that's the other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than even the fourth jhana. But of course, should anyone say, that infinite, ooh boy, that is the utmost and joy that beings can experience. The Buddha would not say that because there is another kind. 
And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by surmounting, completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that vinyana, consciousness, is infinite, a bhikkhu, a renunciate, enters upon and abides in the of infinite consciousness. This, that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime, than the previous pleasure of the base of infinite space. So this is the second formless jhana. If you were paying attention to the last jhana, where we've moved beyond objects, things, diversified objects and things, including self, other, uh, we had left the realm of infinite space, and leaving behind in space, we are left with conscious mind itself, infinite. Just, I, I kind of often say of this state of, this formless state here, that it's just conscious, but not aware of anything. Some people like to say consciousness being aware of itself. I don't even know about that, because that's sort of two the consciousness being aware of consciousness. This is just infinite consciousness. It's what makes these formless jhanas very difficult to talk about and describe because of this, uh, uh, we, we, that we are already in at this point a non-state will where the, the subject and the object, whatever I was meditating, those got quite blurry a while ago. Everybody good? Yeah, maybe a uh, pure consciousness. Would that be a way to say it, Michael? We, say that again? Maybe pure consciousness. Would that be a way of saying it? Um, you know, I don't actually, I wouldn't do pure. Some, some folks might lean towards pure consciousness in that regard. But I would suggest that so let me really quickly walk you through this again the idea here is is that if i'm going to make sense so let's i'm going to back up a couple jhanas <laughs> in fact i'm backing all the way back up to being just a normal conscious person for a moment the idea of how consciousness so we, we're concerned about consciousness right now how it operates or how it works in terms of um, discriminating, distinguishing, again, this from that. The, the way that my consciousness can distinguish my index finger from my middle finger is because of the space, the space between them. If there was no space between my index finger and my middle finger, they would be the same finger. <laughs> that, that would be the very idea is that things conceptually consciously things that occupy the same space are the same thing in a certain sense meaning that in order to distinguish something from another my mind it's a space between them and it even doesn't doesn't need to be a visual space it's just a conceptual space that moves them away other conceptually so that this can be this and this that so there's this interesting thing going on about consciousness making sense of the world vis-a-vis -vis space. Consciousness making sense of the world using space because it's, you know, there's this thing about the music and silence in between the notes. <laughs> well, it's kind of that idea that but there's this like in order to make sense of the music we actually need the the space in between to create tempo rhythm all of these various aspects are a, a dynamic interplay between form emptiness if you will or space and that so if you were following me on, on everything i just said 
The interesting thing about that is the interplay between consciousness and space in that consciousness needs space to think. It, it needs it to make sense of things. Mm -hmm. And what's going on here is, is that in a deep meditative state, going through the first jhanas using mindfulness, we kind of slip into this state where the very individuated objects are gone and it's just infinite space. Mm. Whoa, that's crazy. It's, it's like, whoa. Mm. Well, if you understood that consciousness needs space in order to function, what happens when I take even the space away? Mm. Oh no, you just have consciousness. What the, what the, so it doesn't need pure. It doesn't need to be pure consciousness. It just has to, it's just this weird consciousness that doesn't have not just any object. Again, we left a while ago. It even have the substratum, the metaphysical substratum of space anymore. Mm. Yeah. Just com just business. Did anyone say, Giancarlo, mm -hmm. that all oh, of that, that sounds pretty nice. That, that's the utmost pleasure and joy that beings can experience. Just consciousness. Infinite consciousness with no object, not even a metaphysical substratum. Just consciousness. The Buddha would not agree. Should anyone say that? Then... And what is that other kind of pleasure, Ananda? Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, a bhikkhu, a rena, enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness, akimkanya, nothingness. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So this akimkanya, as it's called in Sanskrit, is, is not too different than our word no-ness, no-thingness, nothing, not even the consciousness. So if you've been following along, we let go of all the objects, we were just with space for a while. Then we were just with the consciousness that was once relying on the space, but is just left with the consciousness. And we transcend even that to be in a full state of absolute nothingness. Maybe it's like void or lack, right? Like this, this idea of like lacking or non nonness it is a meditation on non nonness not absolute nothingness absolute nothingness but should anyone say that that that's it then that's the utmost pleasure and joy that beings can experience right meditating mindful of this base of infinite ness the Buddha wouldn't agree because there is a pleasure more lofty and sublime than that. And what is that other kind of here, Ananda, by surmounting the base of infinite nothingness, a bhikkhu, a renunciant, enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So this is our fourth formless jhana, the state of neither perception nor non-perception, naiva samya ni na samya. Samya is this, the perceptive act and by perception in Buddhism, they are referring particularly between uh, perception as an act 
of identifying things based on quality, their characteristics, or lakshana. And this is a state that is not perceiving things perceptively based on their qualities or characteristics, but is also non non perceptive. This is sort of getting into a realm of what would be called Advaita Vedanta, or this sort of non dual wisdom, where we're talking about neither nor, neither nor non person. For the most part, in the Buddhist tradition, the way, the quick way, because I don't even know what time it is. I probably lost all track of time. Okay. So yeah, so very quickly, up until this point, when we were pleasurable just in our body, when we were pleasurable in the four jhanas, even moving through the first three formless jhanas, easy this from a Buddhist point of view is that all up until that point, there was an axis of reference for all of this activity, which was the meditator, the, the you, whoever you are doing this, there was you and your, or if you were meditating on a candle flame, there was you and the candle flame. And you may have heard your mindfulness or your attention on the candle flame and used it to bring you into a state. And then there you were in a jhanic state and then you there you were in the second third and fourth jhanic state and then you were the first formless realm and then there you were in the state of infinite nothingness and then there you were in the state of the idea of this last fourth formless realm of neither perception nor non-perception way to think of it is that it's when the act the reference, the axis of reference is no longer clung, clinging to some spatial temporal axis. And therefore, the perception that's going on cannot be conceived of as perception like we were doing it up until now, because that was all being done kind of through the sensory organs and through the mind here. We're done with that. We, we're kind of in this state of perception or non-perception, there's no more access, so there's no more perception, but it's not like you're dead. It's not that there's not an awareness, but the idea is, again, the axis of that awareness is no longer um, so tightly clung to such a, a, a spatial temporal axis. This is that fourth jhana, neither person on perception What's about that before i try to get us to the end of the sutra well wonderful so of this state of either perception or non-perception should anyone say that is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings can experience the buddha says i would not concede that to him why is that because there is another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other pleasure, Ananda? Here, by completely surmounting of neither perception nor non-perception, a bhikkhu, a renunciant, enters upon and abides in the cessation of all perception and feeling. This is that other pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. On that, um, in many ways, the little Dharma talk I just applies to that as well. <laughs> in many ways, that is saying what I said about the state of neither perception nor non-perception. And in this sutra, sort of maintaining that state of neither perception nor perception as a state, and then there's the surmounting of that to arrive at a state that I just described which is the one in which the, there's no perception, feeling, access, or anything like that. And within the Buddha path, 
that absolute unclinging, this karmic axis, that's the goal, to not cling to this karmic axis in that sense. It is possible, Amanda, that wanderers of other sects might speak thus about the Buddha. The recluse Gotama speaks of the cessation of perception and feeling, and he describes that as pleasure. What is this? And how is this? Wanderers of other sects who speak should be told, friends, the one describes pleasure not only with reference to pleasant feeling, rather, friends, the Uta, the Tathagata describes as pleasure any kind of pleasure wherever and in whatever way it is found. That's what the Blessed One said, and the Venerable Nanda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So that's the end of the sutra, the sutta, and I would like to emphasize this last point there. And it's something that I spend, a, I feel like a lot of time emphasizing about Buddhism, because for various reasons, I think people have uh, uh, ideas about Buddhism. He was, the Buddha was very clear. No, 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 we're about pleasure. Yeah, we're talking about pleasure. <laughs> and, and it's because he's just kind of using this word in various ways, but this idea that I, I guess the the main point I want to make and then open it up to some last questions here the 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 Buddha is describing these really lofty sublime as he says states of meditation and he's trying to you know convince folks people who might be very into the pleasures of this world, he's convinced there's greater pleasures to be had. He's trying to convince folks that the pleasure that you're getting from objects in the world, and as, as I often say as a Dharma teacher, the pleasure that you get, in your, the pleasure that's dependent, that's dependent upon something, the, pro the problem with pleasure that's dependent on something is that when that's some day, you're no longer ple pleased. You're no longer happy because your joy or your pleasure was dependent on something. What I talk about as a Dharma teacher is that, yeah, the Buddha is talking about how there's greater pleasure to be had from the independent, from that which is not dependent. And ultimately, if we free ourselves of dependency on the objects of this world for our plan and through a process of mind training process of mental training meditation if we train ourselves to in a way receive greater states of pleasure independently not if you follow the the process of meditation not even our own mind. in fact in some instances our it's our mind that's causing us the grief so the greatest pleasure that the buddha is describing that is available is when we that you guessed it no more clinging no more attachment to the things of this world and even to the sort of uh mentation or thought of this world that sort of this great great sublime lofty pleasure can be arrived from in independence so so that's what i'm pushing is uh independence uh any any thoughts ideas comments is everybody there everybody still there I think everybody drifted to the realm no, of infinite, uh, well, infinite space. At least I'm, <laughs> yeah. Hey. 
you kind of ended up that being a little bit tantric in the sense that, yeah, even blissful states of pleasure can arise to greater liberation. Indeed. Hello. Hi, Noe. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, I had a wonderful time sitting here listening to this Dharma and dancing with it. Oh, thank ha, ha. you. Thanks, Noe. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's this, there's nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's doing that's got us all worked up. I think so. I think so. <laughs> thank you so much. My pleasure, Noe. Um, I don't know if I can formulate a question. This is Brendan. Um, hey. Hey. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I like that you wrapped it up with, hey, he's trying to sell the coolness of quieting your mind ridiculously far. And, <laughs> and, and that might actually be cool. Um, and I guess it's, it's uh, I mean, it, it go it, it it, it, it follows with, you know, all the other teaching, which is like, hey, explore and, and see for yourself if this is true. Um, but this is, this to me is, you know, I don't know, I, I, this isn't my complaint or criticism, but just me, I, I feel like this, these types of teachings are a little bit of dangling a carrot. Um, mm. But but I don't think it's like, you know, I think it is um, Upaya, but it's it's also like, uh, hmm. you know, what, what's really far out there, you know, sort of, what, and that, that whatever's really far out there might actually be um, pleasurable. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a wonderful thought. And um, like, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's at the end of the line is, is this wonderfully pleasurable state. So I don't know, there's not really a question in there, but um, it's a great but compliment. I, I <laughs> but I, I appreciate uh yeah, I appreciate your your uh your teaching tonight and turning in. Oh. I'm very, very glad that we can make this happen. Um and actually Brendan, you you quickly mentioned that word upaya or skillful means. And you know, I mentioned in uh or last month when we were doing the talk on on upaya that it's kind of a mahayana idea but this sutra is it's talking about upaya it very explicitly uh, upaya meaning skillful means where the buddha is saying like yeah sometimes i say it's 108 sometimes i say it's 36 sometimes i say it's this sometimes i say it's that and anybody who's like no 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 the buddha said it's three <laughs> that that it's like, dude, like you, you're, you're, you missed it. And I loved, I love the beginning of this sutra where both, and one guy's a monk, by the way, I love that they both thought they were right and the other person was wrong and they were both wrong or they were both right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, 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 like such a beautiful allegory at the beginning of this that, you know, Again, I just wanted to bring us back to that. Anything else? Yeah, it's Jenny. Can you hear me? Hi, yeah, hi, Jenny. <laughs> okay, hi. Oh, it took me a little while to figure this out. Okay, um, for me, the <laughs> thing that really hit home was when you were talking about um, the fingers and the thing that makes the fingers independent is the space in between. And so, like, both guys are right, both guys are wrong. It's the space in between. Ooh, nice. And now I'll start to cry because the, the seriousness of isolation kind of really, really, like, every day it sets in a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. And I feel as if you just brought me back by the sutra, reminding me that it is this space in between. And uh, I just want to thank you. And I'm oh. so stoked. I love the framing too, by the way, of the Zoom thing. I'm so, so I'm very thankful. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everybody else. It was nice to hear everyone's voices. Thanks, Jenny.
And thanks, Katie, for setting this up, getting getting together. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for trying this, you know, Dharma experiment that's now a digital Dharma experiment with us. Um, I have some announcements, but Michael, I don't want to start if, if you have more to say. No? Okay. Oh, no, I, I, I said my piece. Cool. So, yeah, so the doors, the physical doors to the center are closed right now um, and have been since Thursday and will be hopefully for not very long, but we don't know. Um, and most things that were happening at the center will take place at this Zoom link. Uh, with some exceptions. And so the website, um, which is maintained by Gnome, who's here, uh, or the Google Calendar and the Twitter are really good places to check if you're not sure. So coming up uh, all month this month, we have uh, this class plus Mimi, who is here right now, uh, on Tuesdays. Mimi is doing the practice of Satipatthana, which you may know as the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. And then Michael here will be doing complimentary uh, suttas or sutras. Um, so that's all month on Zoom, coming to you live in your bedroom or wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then Michael, not this Friday, but next Friday, is also going to be right here doing a history of Buddhist monastic garments um, with some visual aids and a Q&A, which is going to be super cool. And then one other thing coming up uh, that I want to tell you, you all about because I'm super excited about it is the day after that, so not this Saturday, but next Saturday, we have Tina Rasmussen doing a day long uh, on Zoom. So this is late breaking news. I was just talking to her by email today. Um, and if you were interested in any of the stuff we talked about in this sutra, um, she is an expert at jhana practice. So she was trained in the Pa'oksaido tradition of jhana practice, which means that in order to achieve mastery of any one of these eight jhanas, you have to enter it and remain in it for three hours. So two hours, 59 minutes doesn't count, do it again. Um, and so Tina can do all of these practices that we just talked about, and she's going to be here with us, not this Saturday, but next Saturday. Um, she's in the process of sort of rewiring her class to be more coronavirus beneficial and helpful, but she'll still be around for Q&A and you can ask her about uh, Jana stuff. So stay tuned for all of that. Um, please do donate. Um, even though our doors are not open, we are still paying our rent, uh, which is considerable and has not decreased because of the virus. Um, so if you can, please donate. Um, we'd really appreciate it, especially in this really challenging time uh, for us. This is, this is kind of an existential time for us, and the amount of time we stay closed uh, determines a lot of things. So please donate if you can, and uh, keep coming back and sitting with the Sangha on Zoom. We're here for everyone. Whether you can donate or not, we want to be as much benefit as we can. This would be a really good time to bring a friend, um, teach someone else how to meditate, Give them the tools that you have. Um, it can really be of great benefit to everybody. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Thank Katie. Thank you, Michael, for doing this experiment with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael and Katie. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, Michael, Katie, Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. So good to see you all. Good yeah, night, it's everybody. great to see everybody. Peace.